Hello and welcome everyone to our bright talk today on impossible trade-offs. Uh, we're just going to give a few more minutes, uh, maybe a few more seconds actually, for our uh, uh, live attendees to join um, and then uh, we'll get started. See a number of attendees rolling in here. That's great. So uh, we're going to get started today. I'm going to talk about our agenda. I'm going to give a brief introduction to myself. We're going to talk about what an impossible cybersecurity trade-off is uh, and what the specific trade-off we're going to discuss today is data monitoring and cybersecurity with some real stories from me as the CISO for some companies, as well as uh, you know taking a look at the alternative focus, where we should put our energy. We also have some wonderful resources for you guys, and we'll open it up to Q&A as well. Uh, but just before we begin, a bit of housekeeping. We have three tabs south of the screen today. The first one is for you to ask questions, and we encourage you to do that. The second one is to look at the attachments. These are the leave behinds we give to the attendees of the webinar. And third is a rating of the webinar, which just lets us know what you thought of the talk today and helps us get better at you know putting out content we think is uh, important to you. So let's dive right in. First off, I am Adam Antor, I'm the CISO of Act Zero. I have been in cybersecurity uh, security building, you know, socks since 2005. I have a few certifications, one of which uh, the EC Council Ethical Hacker and others, uh, mostly with tools and certifications on compliance uh, that are meaningful to uh, our customer base. I also operate as a VCSO for our customers within the MDR service at Act Zero to help them with things like best practice and cyber controls. Uh, but enough about me, let's talk about the content here. Uh, what is an impossible trade-off? Well, uh, we put out a white paper, and so this Bright Talk really is accompanying a larger discussion on building your security operations center and the types of trade-offs you have to make when doing so. A trade-off is something you really can't afford to make, right? Often when you think about uh, timelines, budgets, planning, right, you usually commit resources in a particular area, and sometimes that leaves you very little optionality, the ability to do something else with that time or money. A great example of this is, you know, for customers during the pandemic, setting up work from home, you know, a bunch of laptops go out and then there's a rush to sort of get cloud enabled services up and running. Right. And so do we secure the cloud? Do we protect our network? Do we do the endpoints? Do we do all of the above? Uh, and so you're going to have to make some difficult choices in terms of how you do some things as you change architecture or make quick decisions to try to enable your staff. Now, when you think about overcoming these types of trade-offs, there's a couple of different uh, considerations to make. First off, whether you're going to do this all in-house, whether you're going to decide to co-manage it with a, with a partner, right? You're gonna call for help or you're gonna outsource the entire thing, right? You're gonna move to a, a different design where uh, you're not building, you're just you know gonna buy a service. And so across those uh, different types of when we're business decisions, the larger decisions, there usually are secu uh, security considerations uh, that are building your sock around this concept, right? So whether uh, you, you know, want to focus on data monitoring, which what we're going to talk about today, threat intelligence or proactive preparedness, these are all the things that we obviously talk about in the white paper that I encourage you to read uh, as well. But today we're going to focus very specifically on in-house when you're building your own in-house uh, data monitoring uh, uh, for cybersecurity and what trade-offs you have to consider when doing so. So let's also clear up what data monitoring is, right? Because there could be very many different uh, definitions for this. Uh, so the definition for us is that you are going to do continuous review of system data, right? System data can include things like the logs, right? Endpoint detection and response logs, uh, Windows event logs, other types of application logs for anomalies which indicate a cyber attack. Right. This is very different than looking at alerts, which are things that are produced by prevention products to say, hey, something happened here, you know, and we've blocked it. Right. An example of this is reviewing activity both proactively pre attack and what we call threat hunting, where you're looking at through the data uh, with a theory in mind about, uh, you know, a potential anomaly or attack or behavior that you're looking for. And then the second one is post alert by going forensically through that raw data after something sends you a signal, right? A, a notice to, to go and do something. 
the typical source for this, and this is where you had a lot of different cybersecurity discussions, what should we be logging, right? Uh, so source systems for this information are things like Windows events, right? Your endpoint detection and response logs, which are, are usually from your antivirus or, or next gen AV. Firewall logs, which, you know, are usually, you know, uh, north, south, you know, next gen could be current, you know, old legacy, uh, could do a lot of things from URL filtering, to app filtering, et cetera. Cloud logs, of course, for those that have, you know, migrated to maybe like an 0365 or have hosting in Azure or AWS, uh, as well as things like identity logs, right? And usually this is the type of stuff that's either, you know, sourced in those places, but may even be centrally collected in something like a SIM, right? So the concept here is that when you're building your security monitoring, kind of a foundational concept behind a SOC, right? If you have an operation, the operation is to probably review the logs in these ways, and this is how you do that, right? So we're gonna talk about the in-house version uh, and the trade-offs that you end up with uh, in shared IT resources here for two different kinds of organizations. The first kind of organization that we're gonna talk about is when you are a small organization, right? So if you are on the smaller end, uh, and again, this can have many definitions. This is not trying to you know, make anybody seem small, but you know, if you have a single IT resource that's dedicated to security, and that is the technical aspects of security uh, for software, you're usually sharing that FTE resource in a company this size um, with the system admin work, right? Whether it's networking or systems administration, usually responsible for something like the endpoint operating system, uh, servers or cloud administration, new users, moves ads and changes, that type of stuff, right? The technology most of these uh, enterprises have is, you know, things like next generation antivirus. They have maybe some EDR, maybe light. It might be built in uh, to the product as well to block malware. From a firewall perspective, usually you have a gateway. Maybe you have multiple sites, you have multiple gateways, uh, but you usually have sort of a next gen firewall up at the edge to block things like URL filtering or to, you know, uh, you set up policies for what ports are allowed in or out of the organization. And of course, you likely also have enabled at this point in time, uh, cloud or hybrid uh, email, web, file management, things like SharePoint, OneDrive, of course, collaboration like Teams, uh, Zoom and others uh, are, are likely part of your stack, right? So these are usually the things you have um, as a surface, right? So you're looking at the servers, the workstations, the network, and you're looking at them in these ways. This is what's generating the data. And more often than not, your process in this environment is to do things on a daily or a weekly. You have a routine that you build where, you know, every Friday I get a firewall report or every Monday I get a, a stats report, right? That's sometimes how it goes down or, you know, usually you'll have uh, your help desk just sort of tell you to do something and that's, that sort of consumes everything else, right? Um, the other thing you're doing, of course, is break fix, right? You're managing the tools, you're managing the connectors, you're making sure everything's up and running, uh, likely alongside a bunch of other systems that are considered critical. Usually your size is about, you know, a uh, thousand or less uh, employees, right? Probably about a thousand or so devices uh, that you're kind of working with here. And your work window is nine to five, though most IT people listening to this will laugh and say, yeah, they probably it's more than nine to five because I have a cell phone I bring home, I answer email all the time, I'm maybe in early or out late. Uh, but that's what it's supposed to be, right? Is that there's a, a nine to five work day and we're supposed to carve out time in between there. Uh, to do monitoring, right? To, to, to do uh, reviews of this data. And so, you know, you're probably looking at a max output of four hours a day of reviewing your security tools, looking at security product, which even that for most people would probably sound a little generous. The other type of organization is uh, a bit larger, right? And so the typical way that these organizations grow first is that they likely have more people on staff as there's more work to do, right? You'd be up 5,000 or so users, right? The, the, the workload is somewhat split now. So people tend to then go in specialize, right? They'll get a, you know, a desktop admin, a server admin, uh, maybe they have backfills for each other's roles, but you're probably up to about three FTE on average, three full-time people. Uh, that are dedicated to this process and they're responsible for just a little bit more, right? Usually you have uh, in a company this size a little bit more scrutiny on things like auditing or vulnerability management, maybe a little bit more on applications. Maybe you guys make an application, you have a dev group, you have an outsourced dev group. And so there's going to be some interactions with these multiple teams and, and these uh, kind of your core squad has to go between multiple areas here. Now on the technology side, 
you're usually going and buying things, uh, especially at this volume, uh, from sort of tier one enterprise vendors. So you're, you're getting the next gen AV, you have EDR, you're getting a lot more in the way of, uh, you know, uh, licensing likely for things like UTM, firewall, et cetera, because you now need more in those tools to enable those teams to do more with less, right? You likely also have uh, a little bit more of a, you know, uh, security posture. So you've enhanced the things like MFA, RMM, uh, RMM remote management of, of systems, DRM, things like Active Directory or Okta or one of these other identity products uh, that are going to show up and essentially harden your, uh, your user access scenarios, right? And also because of the size and the breadth of these, you might even end up with something like a SIM or log management of some kind uh, as well. You likely are starting to move into whether the cloud infrastructure is a little bit more Azure, a little bit less, you know, 0365. Uh, the concept here is that you of course have a cloud as well and, and likely have migrated there. Um, these people also share the security responsibility, but they may have uh, specific tools that they're coordinating reviews in, whether it's change auditing in something like your SIM and looking at the daily alerts or alarms that are configured by default from these products. Uh, and of course, you know, you have a lot more systems to keep up and running. So there's obviously your you know, pager duties and things going off to keep you uh, in the loop. Now, you also try to widen with this new team, the idea of on-call, right? You probably have to service multiple time zones. You're likely dealing with sort of weekend work in some cases, even if it's just for changes. So the window is a little larger for this type of customer base and your max output between the three people for monitoring is somewhere around 12 hours. Now, of course, this is a, a depiction of yourselves. So you're probably thinking, yeah, 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 that sounds kind of like me, or maybe you're way off. Uh, either way, uh, it's important to understand the trade-off context. When you look at the raw information that's coming pre and post, when you have an alert, or when you're looking for something before there's an alert, the concept behind data monitoring within security is that you're going to have to deal with the volume Right. And so the personnel, at, if you start at the bottom here, are likely able to handle about 10 alerts a day. Right. This is probably fitting to within the monitoring window per person. Right. So if you think immediately about, you know, the scaling of this, if you multiply the, the, the data that's coming from these products on average, uh, whether you're small or you're medium, right, the human impact is not very high. Right? You didn't get much more ability to process alerts or alarms, much more ability for humans to scale the, the reading of the, the raw data and the threat hunting or the response forensics after the fact, uh, even though your, you know, your actual plant had multiplied with 5x. Right? So even if you were to keep it one to one for every you know, thousand users or for every thousand devices, adding another body, right? you, you still are, are sort of um, in the reverse of the funnel because that's, that's how many things, objects you can look at each day, right? Even with, you know, all kinds of aggregation and reports and analytics and whatever, you're still getting it to the point where you're probably looking at 10 individual investigations, right? Which means if you have three people, you're probably close to 30. Now, the issue is that the products you typically have are either aggregating their alerts or they're aggregating logs to create new alerts. And those typically produce between 100 on the small end alerts or 500 on the larger end alerts a day, right? Which means that you're probably not looking at every one of those alerts. You're going to be starting to group, mass close, mass delete, um, you know, alerts just to prevent the snowball of it getting out of control. If you can maintain connecting to this every single day, which is where a lot of teams sort of also struggle is to come into the environment without, you know, a ticket or a user based alert to say, please go in and, and figure out what's going on with X or Y. On the raw data side, it gets much, much worse, right? And you can see how immediately on the raw events per second, it's just simply untenable for anybody to consider looking at that volume of information on a daily basis, right? So when you think about the few hours that you have to contribute to reviewing logs, if it isn't an alert, it's simply not gonna happen. And maybe even then not all alerts are going to happen. So you kind of have the threat hunting case. And then of course, the other case not working. And so, you know, the, the primary area to say, okay, well, we're going to have to trade something off. If we're doing this in-house, we cannot rely on products that have this much volume. They simply can't, right? And so this is something that almost immediately has to be understood as a trade-off. We cannot apply more people to the problem of alerts that are too high for us to manage, right? And if you go into your security products, either during this call or after, and say, how many alerts, how many alarms, critical or high or other notifications, are present in my endpoint network and cloud monitoring systems, the products that we talked about. If the number is very different from this, I'd love to hear about it, right? Feel free to, you know, submit in the question and say, we get nothing like that because, and let us know. 
Now, the, the, the idea there is that, of course, we have to shrink this number to match something like this number. So how do we do that, right? And so when you think about the concept, right, of course, in the white paper, we discuss the idea of outsourcing, right? And so, you know, could you outsource this problem to someone else and have them affect the change? Uh, well, if they're an MSSP that's doing the same thing with you, it doesn't matter how many people they have, even if they added 50, you're still not going to be over and above the alerts that are coming from those systems by default. So how do we do that? Well, one of the major advances in uh, data monitoring in general is the idea that in data science, there's components called machine learning, right? Machine learning is a process by which, you know, you can take much more advanced AI science and allow multiple uh, things to be considered at the same time, right? So as a predictive tool to be able to tell you uh, more uh, accurate alerts, right? Reduce the number of uh, alerts you have to look at. It's an effective tool at doing certain kinds of monitoring for data, data monitoring. What kinds of analysis can we expect machine learning to do and find good signal in? Well, there's a hierarchy, right? Some things it's very good at and some things it's not very good at. And so this pyramid, while it's you know got a lot of words on it, sort of prioritizes for uh, you know those on the phone that are saying, well, what kind of alerts can we expect to get to a certain level of accuracy that might fit within our window uh, of response or an outsourcer's window of response. And so there's a number of different categories here, right? A normal behavior of a uh, of a, uh, a file or a process, right? You can see those as number four and number three here at the top left. And so those are great examples of how things that are leveraging machine learning, like your EDR or your, your SIM, could uh, have an option for you to see less alerts that are more accurate because they can be more closely tie with attacker behavior instead of just generic admin behavior, very simple policies, right? And again, many of those products, unfortunately, are not configurable to do this type of thing. They, they, they sometimes uh, just can't, you know, uh, build this type of, of capability because they just don't have the, the tools within it to do that. And so it's important to ask them what the false positive ratio are. Are they doing these types of uh, detections and responses uh, in their outsourcing or, or can you do it with their product is also a great question to ask uh, because uh, these things are sort of market wide. Right. They just this is what you could use ML for to do analysis, regardless of who you are. Right. So it's, it's helpful to look at this pyramid and sort of ask the questions about account takeovers or file analysis or other things that are built into the endpoint network or cloud monitoring, as opposed to are you looking at my logs? Because there's an efficiency there that you have to calculate in the tools. So knowing this, right, knowing that we cannot scale more people or to focus our energy or time more specifically on anything but alerts, you now know that you have to cut the raw data down to certain alerts, which means you now have a trade off, right? What are you going to do if not doing that monitoring time? And it's important to understand from some stories, I think, that's probably the most helpful way I can describe this, uh, where the trade off was actually really well spent. Right. And so I'll take a, a quick example here of a, a customer hit by ransomware in the middle of the evening. Right. And, you know, most people would look at the root cause and say our systems didn't stop this. The alerts weren't there. Somebody wasn't looking. Some process wasn't happening. And the concept here is that while, you know, you could take a look in retrospect at where an alert may have come from, at some point it would have happened after hours. Right. And so most of these attacks are planned by the adversary uh, to go somewhere on the weekend uh, or specifically, uh, you know, uh, in times when you're likely to be less resourced, right? And even if you have, you know, uh, one to three resources, the concept is that that security hero that's actually on call, right, may not have, um, you know, the ability to quickly identify from the user reported issue where something is in that stack in time, right? So well, basically what, what happened here is that they didn't make a trade-off uh, well, right? Instead of focusing on coverage and monitoring, they didn't focus on how long an attack would take to spread through the entire environment, which is a very important piece of information to have. If you have an alert, it's not so much just how many alerts you have or how many people you have, it's the ability for you to be able to go back and look through one of those alerts when you even are reported uh, an actual issue, right? And so the lesson here was that they really could have learned from you know proactive hardening, best practice, to slow things down that made it very hard. And the, the best example I could use um, you know, is if they were sitting there wondering how long it would take to make a change to every single computer, that's how much time it would take for an attacker to 
uh, cause an issue with one account, right? So you want to make sure that you know, you're not slowing down IT changes yourself. You, you still have to be very productive, but a lot of this hardening, which we're going to talk about in a few slides, would have been a better trade-off because they could have shrunk the time to react that, you know, uh, would have helped them after hours get to something uh, been a lot uh, slower for the attacker and therefore give them more time to do it. Another example, of course, is uh, when nothing makes a noise, right? Most people will sort of say, well, you know, if, if there is no alarm, if there's no notification from a system, if this completely bypassed everything, then they beat us, right? And so a lot of the insights that are actually buried forensically, and, and a lot of cyber insurers who do these IR, you know, exams after something like ransomware will tell you the same information, which is that, you know, forensically, when they pull out the logs, maybe there was some new zero day or new way that they use living off the land or some fun technique to bypass uh, setting off an alarm. I apologize. A lot of people want to hear this webinar, so we're going to drill through my ceiling today to get it. Uh, but the concept is that there is a number of, of uh, different things that maybe didn't fire, right? No alerts fired on the endpoint, no alarms fired from the, the firewall. And so, you know, could we could we really be blamed for not being notified of this attack? And again, you know, the concept here is that a lot of the things that may have gone uh, deprioritized because they believed a lot in their prevention technology, things like, you know, vulnerability remediation could have really helped there, right? Over the past year, a lot of supply chain uh, services like, you know, uh, solar winds or, you know, uh, half EM in exchange, not exactly, you know, supply or software, not supply on every single device, but had a bunch of remote code execution vulnerabilities, right? And so as these get notified, they very quickly needed to be you know, patched, right? They gave a few weeks, for example, uh, of dwell time uh, before uh, this attack was actually used against this particular customer. And that was a lot of, of lead time for somebody to be able to apply a patch for something that was known as a critical vulnerability, right? So the trade-off here again, for, for both companies in this case, was to try to slow something down to give less opportunities for the attacker uh, to be successful instead of, you know, um, putting a lot of energy on monitoring and, and awareness and, and being ready to jump on, uh, you know, these attacks, even if they did have um, some of the best forensic products out there that could easily see what happened. Uh, again, they were using them forensically, right? So this is a, another lesson about saying, well, rather than trade off the hour of energy you're going to have against this uh, particular defense strategy, try to slow it down, slow, slow, slow it down get rid of the vulnerabilities, harden things so that it's very, very uh, hard to move from asset to asset and giving you more time to use those tools uh, to look something up or discuss what's going on. Now, examples of the policies, of course, that we're talking about, and anybody who's talked to me before one-on-one uh, -on -one or in one of our sessions basically knows, you know, my favorite four policies, right? The first one is uh, software restriction policy, app locker policy, the Windows-based policy, uh, um, predominantly, but you know there are other versions within your you know Macintosh and Linux environment. The concept here is that your software restriction policies reduce the likelihood that there's going to be a utility, a script, something else that's going to bypass permissions and run amok in in the environment. So this is one of the ways to lock down within the operating system. And if you widen that out and say, well, number two here, host firewall policy. You know, almost every single device nowadays, workstation, server. Uh, I think there's even versions for mobile now, has host firewall capabilities, right? These utilities are either free or already built into the operating system. They will slow things down from a communication perspective, right? They will they will uh, give you a default policy that allows you just inbound for your workstations as an example. Very easy, uh, cheap policy to put in place that likely doesn't have any functional ramifications, right? That doesn't stop anything from working because why are inbound services actually configured on your workstation in the first place, right? So great place to spend the one or two hours a day that you have rather than monitoring logs is putting these things in place. Monitor your host firewall logs, see what processes you do have to block and block them. The third is accounts, right? You need accounts to move between machines. You need network access like firewall uh, allows to let you through to other uh, systems, right? Restricted groups can help you lock down, separate, rule of least privilege, separation of duty. Restricted groups is a great group policy within Windows to say that if I have an account, this is the only one that can log into the machine as opposed to having an account and being able to use every machine. Right. The last one is vulnerability management. Right. And I know what a lot of you are thinking, like, oh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, those are, are, you know, something that we're always going to have to deal with. And you're right. But 
you know, critical vulnerabilities, high vulnerabilities should be dealt with with that level of intensity, right? If the confidentiality, integrity, and availability is considered as bad as a critical, uh, that means that there's very likely going to be complete destruction of the asset, complete access to the data, or that they're going to have complete, you know, access to the system because of this vulnerability, right? So we want to make sure that we're removing those, uh, you know, critical and high vulnerabilities at the very least as fast as possible. And in the capital of examples that we talked about, at least one of them, you know, there was a, a critical vulnerability that, you know, they had 20 or so days to, to, to patch and frankly, you know, it would have saved them the, the fallout of the exploit, right? So that pretty much wraps it up for uh, the conversation here. We are going to open it up to QA uh, before we do so. I just want to try to talk about some of the resources we have as well. There's the link, of course, for the attachments. But here in the resources, we uh, have the fuller, uh, you know, uh, opportunity cost of making this, um, you know, impossible trade-off. We talk about other trade-offs, everything from vulnerability management to doing things in-house or, or off. Um, we also have testing and validation to make sure that it works, right? So some usable examples of how you would test and validate uh, your response time. So what happens when you monitor? Well, you're going to find something and then you're going to have to do something about it. So how do you make sure that your monitoring is effective? How do you make sure your response is effective when something happens? Uh, something that's calculated uh, for you in, in that paper as well. And then, of course, um, we're always talking about trade-offs, but we're also talking about how to appropriately resource your security operations center, right? So the word hyperscale SOC is really about how you can affect the changes that will keep you ahead of the adversary or ahead of these uh, problems on data volume or context switch. So uh, I'll turn it over now, I think, to some Q&A. Um, the first question that I have here is uh, can we not just use machine learning inside inside the detection products we have to block instead of outsourcing? Um, I mean, certainly when you think about uh, machine learning in general, right, there may be AI or a capability to do that within certain products. Uh, if you look up most sims and, and say, do you guys have a machine learning component? Uh, the answer is likely yes, they do, right? Uh, however, um, it's not turnkey. Right. These are things that will allow a more generic data analysis with those products and off the shelf tools that don't necessarily receive the same outcome without a heavy investment in labor. Right. And so usually the outsourcing to get the outcome is because you want the data science team or somebody to actually train the models uh, for you. Right. Your data set might even be too small for you to actually see uh, real accuracy with that. Right. So the concept behind the science is that you want more data because it it might make it better to be more accurate and you also want a team that's going to test it and manage it effectively. Um, so you, you certainly can rely on some of the, the tools that have AI, but you must understand the investment it takes to receive the outcome and the accuracy, which could take a long time and a lot of data you may not even have. Uh, another question here is, what should companies be monitoring from the stack 24-7? Yeah, I think that it, it, depending on, again, if it's a trade-off organizationally to say in-house or outsource, like what are we supposed to be monitoring? The obvious three surfaces are the endpoint network and cloud, right? And when you talk about the endpoint, usually you have, you know, you have to run software there. So it makes sense to monitor the activity and the changes on the operating system. If you think about the network, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts to your network, you know, obviously the endpoint monitoring in and out, but also uh, inside and outside. If you're protecting, let's say, web servers or egress outside traffic, internet traffic from a, a, an office, right? Your firewall makes a great, uh, you know, uh, tool to monitor. And lastly, if you have a cloud surface, right, you, you obviously have workloads that are kind of their own data center up there, right? And so uh, monitoring the hypervisor and, and virtual machines that you have deployed within the cloud is obviously another essential part of the service. And what you're looking for are cyber attacks, right? And so if you are familiar with the MITRE framework, MITRE attack is a great way that you try to cap catalog all the different types of things you can monitor. They kind of go from the beginning of the attack to later the attack. So if you're trying to monitor for something, you know, late stage is sort of fast, but very heavy in terms of its impact. Up front, you probably have a better opportunity to keep people out of the environment. So, you know, in the, on the either ends of those things are great things to ask people to monitor. And then if they're using other tools, uh, refer back to that, you know, priority scheme matrix and say, hey, are you guys monitoring for this? And are you using the right uh, technology to do that?
Um, you mentioned some policies. How, how much slower do these policies actually make breakout time? It's a great question. I think when you when you look at statistics, I mean, depending on who you ask and who's been recording it, uh, you could get you know some numbers that say it's 29 minutes is sort of the average breakout time. That is, you know, before an attack goes through most of the organization, right? Uh, others would say it's about an hour and a half, an hour 40 uh, in terms of, of destruction, right? From my experience, I mean, you know, it's hard to say exactly T1 to T2 between bouncing between machines and how much it accelerated, but it's very fast. I would say mostly somewhere closer to half an hour, between an hour. Um, and so that's, that's what breakout time is. How slow does it make it when you apply the policies we talked about? Uh, well, a, uh, it makes the jump uh, require retooling, right? So it's, it's hard to make a jump that works perfectly uh, between all your assets in that case, which means you might have an attack that hits a certain number of devices that are allowed to reach with the firewall. You might have an attack that allows a particular location on the operating system to run software, but not others. You may have a user credential that you stole that works on this machine, but not others, right? So it kind of limits the blast radius, which forces the attacker to retool and to rethink how they're going to go from point A to point B again, right? So uh, depending on how tight the blast radius is, a full breakout uh, may actually take days, right? And by then, you're usually getting user reported information. Uh, very quickly because retooling and refocusing on that new place they landed after spreading is going to take them uh, even more time, right? And so uh, attackers are going to want to be as destructive as possible early to get as much likelihood that you'll pay their extortion. And so this just makes it much more difficult for them to do that cost benefit analysis and hopefully move on. Another question is, what if I add more people? Won't that just remove some trade-off options? Uh, I mean, there's obviously when we say committing resources is a, a trade-off. You've already invested in something and can't invest in something else. Um, you know, it's it's try not to think about people like that, right? The, the people can adapt. <laughs> there's a lot uh, that they can do uh, in, in terms of their optionality. So those IT resources are quite skilled. They probably didn't monitor and manage the same systems that change every year uh, in order to uh, adapt to their new responsibilities, right? Like we didn't have, you know, as many cloud workloads as we did before. Those were usually our Windows admins that were adapting to that. They didn't have Windows 10 in 2019. They didn't have, you know, the new Zoom thing. And so there's a lot to the way that, uh, you know, people uh, are, are not necessarily a sunk cost, right? You're paying them continually. They can learn new skills and they can adapt to the new environments uh, and play a better position on the field. So try not to think of them as, a quarterback and never anything else, this, these people can obviously adapt to the, the very many needs that you're presenting them with. So um, I wouldn't say that that's a, a, a trade off necessarily, but it is a concept of saying, where do you want to focus that energy? And it's very important to understand that that is probably one of the most valuable resources you have is that human brain, that supercomputer that cannot be replicated in software yet, but knowing where to position it outside of, you know, you know, the, the mundane tasks and more on the creative hardening communication the places they can have the greatest impact on your cyber posture is, is where we think to deliver it. So vulnerability management, infosec management, so an excellent job because they're there to do security awareness training and help your users and everything else um, and obviously fix the, the problems that the machines are presenting. One last time, I appreciate everyone who joined the call today. I'm going to mention, of course, the resources one more time. We've obviously got the white paper. Uh, we've got the uh, the, the uh, val validating and testing uh, sort of exercise as well as explaining how to hyperscale a SOC. So, uh, you know, for those uh, who are attending uh, virtually now and, and later, you know, there's a resource tab. And then, of course, those links will be active also on our website at axero.ai slash resources. Please also don't forget to rate us and have a great day. Thanks for joining.